Okay, let's turn to Acts chapter 9. We're going uh, through the book of Acts, and we are, uh, we've come to Acts 9 and 10 are two of the most significant conversions. One is of uh, the apostle Paul, or Saul, and the other is Cornelius. And we're going to look at uh, the first part of Saul's conversion this morning, the, the most famous conversion in history. I think we think we know this. You know, I, I really do. I, I came to this thinking, oh, I know this. And it's kind of like, yeah, we know. Saul was met by Jesus on the Damascus Road, had this amazing experience, now move on. And as I've been reflecting on this, I realized how little I actually know about this. So I hope uh, that you benefit from, this, benefit from this as much as I had looking at this. We do use the expression still, a Damascus Road experience. So again, without making any political points, I heard it most recently in uh, J.D. Vance um, of Hillbill Hillbilly, Elegy fame, Hillbilly Elegy fame. Great book, by the way. Uh, and... Uh, he was described as having a Damascus Road conversion because a few years ago he compared Donald Trump to, to Hitler and now he's his vice president. And that's what we mean by a Damascus Road conversion, isn't it? You complete uh, turn around. But when we think about conversion, we also need to think, and this is what we're, we will look at later, how do you actually know you're a Christian? And how do you know someone else is a Christian? Have you ever thought we do this? We look at someone or we hear someone say, oh, well, they're a Christian. Well, how do you know? What, what, how, how, how do each of us know whether we are Christians or not? And it's, it's almost impossible to judge by somebody else's experience. And it's wrong to judge other people by your experience. So let's look at this and see what we can learn from it. So we'll start uh, the first two verses. We're going to look at Christ's enemy, when Saul was Christ's enemy. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, Saul has already been mentioned in this book uh, three times. In chapter 7 and verse uh, 58. Meanwhile, this is at the stoning of Stephen, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man. So he's a young man named Saul. Chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul approved of their killing him. And chapter 8, verse 3, but Saul began to destroy the church, growing from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now, Saul was born in the city of Tarsus. And again, I never thought about this. I thought, Saul, he came from Jerusalem. No, he didn't. He came from Turkey. That's the first thing. He, it was the main city of Cilicia on the southern coast of what we now call Turkey. And as such, he grew up uh, learning Greek, the Greek language and, cult and culture. And three times, actually, in the New Testament, Saul cites Cilician poets, uh, the poets Aratus, Meander, and Epimendes. Uh, in that he does that in Acts 17, 28, and in Titus chapter 1, verse 12. He's a smart guy. Uh, he was a Jew, but unusually for that area, he was a Pharisee, the strictest, the really, really strictest of the Jewish sects. And there were not many of those in southern Turkey. So we think that's why he went to Jerusalem to study. We know that he also studied at Jerusalem. So basically, he's a young man, he's a religious man, he's a moral man, he has um, got two PhDs at least. Uh, he, he's considered some kind of authority as well. Also, even to me, just as interestingly, he was a Roman citizen. Now, that was very unusual in that area. And we think it probably it was because his father was a city elder or something, and Paul had this passed on to him. Now, that's going to play a big factor later on. So you, you see all the different strands of everything coming together. Sometimes you wonder why things happen to us, and then only later when you back off can you see how God has prepared you for a particular task. And then this about Saul. He, he was really evil. 
You know, we think Saul, uh, he was converted and he changed his name to Paul. No, Paul was his Roman name. Saul was called Paul before he became a Christian. But Paul was really evil. Um, it, it's... It's interesting, I think he took the name or used the name Saul initially because it was more Hebraic. And when he was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles, he reverted to his Roman name. He hated the church. He hated Christ. And he was really passionate in his hatred. We're told here that some had escaped his net and he asked for letters to the synagogue in Damascus. Now, Damascus was at least uh, 220 kilometers away from Jerusalem and it was at least a week's journey. He got the chief priest to sanction his plan. This was under the Roman Empire, but the Jews were allowed to have internal discipline uh, amongst the Jewish people. And he asked, in effect, to go to Syria so that he could imprison Christians and kill Christians. That's how much he hated them. The language that's used here is similar to what we sang in Psalm 80, verse 3. Boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the fields feed on it. And he caused havoc in Jerusalem. We know that. Um, verse 21, isn't he the man of chapter 9 who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? Saul was cruel, callous, cold, self-righteous, hateful, bigoted, and a murderer. Calvin speaks of him being a cruel wolf turned not only into a sheep, but a shepherd. I don't know if there's any more spectacular example of the grace and mercy of God than uh, the story of Saul and Paul. And sometimes because it's so familiar, we, we don't wonder at it as much as we could. Why such hatred? You'll notice that he was against those who belong to the way, as, as it is described here. Now, why is it called the way? Why did Paul react against that so much? Psalm 16, verse 11 says, You have made known to me the path or the way of life. Isaiah 40, he shall make straight the way. Make straight the way for the Lord. And to Saul, with all his rabbinic learning and with all his intelligence and with all his understanding of the Old Testament, these people were destroying the way by claiming to be the way. When Jesus said, I am the way, it had a depth and a significance that perhaps many of us wouldn't like. Now, you see, in our culture as well, I think this can be quite offensive to people because, ah, oh, there are many ways, aren't there? There are many ways to God, and there are many ways to do this. And many, you do your way, that's fine. You want to be Presbyterians, come and sit in a cold church on a Sunday morning, that's up to you. You know, but I've got my way, you've got yours. Let's just all be tolerant of each other. Except they just can't be tolerant of people who say, this is the way, walk in it. Such hatred. And it's, it's not something that just happened with Saul. It's something that has continued and resurfaces again and again in human society. So today, there will be people in northern Nigeria who are going to church and they don't know if there's going to be a bomb or someone come in with a gun and kill them just because they are Christians. In the Islamic states, under communism. And you might think a, a more subtle way, but also devastating, I think of the Olympics. Now, you say, what's the Olympics got to do with this? Well, some of you will have seen this. Um, there was a, a display at the opening ceremony of the Olympics of a bunch of drag queens and basically people dressed sexually explicitly doing a parody of the Lord's Supper. Now, how can that be done at a public gathering? You know, why, why would people do that? I don't think people would do it or should do it about Islam. Or anyone. Anyway, why would people do it? Because deep down, 
There is this hatred against God, and we are his enemies. So this is Saul. He, he, you don't want Saul anywhere near you. You don't want Saul in your church. You don't want Saul. You, you just, uh, you know, uh, it just doesn't come across as a very pleasant person at all. How could he ever become a believer? But he did, and the fact that God changed his heart should give us some degree of hope. Now, as he goes on this journey, there are some indications that God was already working in his heart. How do we know that? Sometimes people double down when we begin to suspect, to suspect we are wrong. Have you ever done that? I mean, it might be that you're the very mild, gentle sort of person, you know, that when someone points out something that's wrong, you say, oh, I got that wrong. You know, and then you, but a lot of us are not like that. A lot of us, we just double down. We've made a mistake, but we rectify the mistake by doubling down on it, determined to show that we are right. And I suspect that later on we read about the goads and Paul uh, Saul being pricked. And we, we, we looked several weeks ago at the death of Stephen and Stephen's prayer, whose, his face was like an angel, and Stephen's prayer that... Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And immediately after that, that's where you get Saul approved of their killing him. I don't think that ever left him. And I think that he doubled down because of that. I think he would have been much more able to handle if Stephen had been spitting out hatred. But to say, do not hold this against him, that really, it didn't win him over. But I think it really must have gone to him. Now, imagine this. So he, he decides he's going to Damascus. He's raging. I mean, it's furious. He's, it, it says he's got murderous anger in his heart. And as we say, it would take a, uh, the journey would have been made on foot. It would have taken a week. He took the officers of the Sanhedrin, who were a kind of private police force. But he himself, because he was distinct from them, because he was a Pharisee, he would walk alone. And when you've got to walk a week on your own, you think. You know, one of the things in our culture is we automatically distract ourselves or we get distracted. Um, sometimes I think it would sometimes be better for us when we hear God's word if we just withdrew and thought about it. And, you know, you go out and you walk and, and somehow in the silence or whatever and in your own company, is he'd have to walk through Galilee. Now, he knows Jesus as the man from Galilee. It's almost certain, in fact, it's almost impossible to imagine that he hadn't seen Jesus, that he didn't know about Jesus. So he's walking through Galilee, and he has a physical reminder of the man from Galilee. And then this happens, verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now the painting that I put up is uh, Michelangelo's famous painting of this. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not accurate, but I, I liked it anyway. Uh, but he's going to Damascus. Now Damascus then, as, uh, as now, was a very beautiful city. In fact, it's one of the oldest cities in the world, if not the oldest. It existed at the time of Abraham. And it was l literally an oasis in the desert. So he's going there, the people with him are going there, and uh, this light from heaven flashes around him. And he hears this voice addressing him in Aramaic, not in Greek, and that's how you get Saul, Saul, Saul. A repetition of the name. Why are you persecuting me? And can you imagine how Saul feels at that time? First of all, he knew immediately he was wrong. 
Jesus was alive. He killed people for saying Jesus was alive. He had thought Jesus was dead. This was completely shattering. His whole life, his whole worldview was completely turned upside down. It's so interesting. Again, we live in a world where people think that the possibility of change, true change, doesn't really happen. You're always who you are. You're always the, the victim of your circumstances. Nobody really changes their mind or their hearts. And yet that's what happened to him. And he also, when Jesus said, why do you persecute me? He must have realized then, and this is going to become a key part of his theology later on, that in attacking the church, he's attacking Christ. The favorite phrase that Saul or Paul uses for being a Christian is in Christ, someone who's in Christ. So actually, when you're asking, is someone converted, you're saying, are you in Christ or not? And that's actually, I think that's personally, I think that's a much better way of asking the question. The term Christian, as we'll see, gets used later on. They were in the way and all this kind of stuff. But, but for Paul, it means being in Christ. Are you in Christ? It's a very profound question. But at this point, it became, you know, abundantly clear that in locking up Christians, he was persecuting Christ. Now, this was not a vision. It was not a dream. It was the real risen Lord. The light he saw was the glory of Christ, and the voice he heard was the voice of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9.1, he says, Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? In fact, if you've got a Bible, turn to Acts 22, and you'll see um, Saul's account of this. Uh, it, it adds a little bit more than Luke had. So in in uh, Acts 22... Verse 3, Paul says this, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way. You see that again? This way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I mean, he was really in. Like he was right at the top of all of this. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me, Lord. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you be told all that you've been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And that very moment I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. See, you notice that, to see the righteous one. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Saul was hunting Christians and the hunter became the hunted. Because this is the initiative of Jesus. There are some people who try to say, well, actually, um, Saul was really seeking Christ. No, he wasn't. He was running away from him. In fact, he wasn't running away from him. He was running to attack him. But Christ wasn't going to let him go. And he talks later on in the letters, you'll get phrases like, I, I strive to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. He talks about how Christ got him. There's a very famous poem called The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. Um, I, I won't read it all, but there's a, a bit I would love to read. And it goes this, because I love this. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him and under running laughter. Up visitated hopes I sped and shot, precipitated down titanic glooms of chasmed fears. 
from those strong feet that followed, followed after. See, there are people who run away from God. I know that some of you are gravely concerned about children or grandchildren or friends who maybe once professed faith or grew up in the church and have become incredibly hostile. Sometimes they're, they're just fleeing God. And the thing is, the hound of heaven, he, he goes for people. When we talk about people seeking Jesus and we need to find people who are seeking Jesus, to be honest, nobody seeks, really. I think Jesus seeks them. And I think we, if we are Christians, we're part of that. Christ seized him. There's a lovely juxtaposition here. Christ arrested him. He uses that word. Christ arrested him before he had the chance to arrest any Christians. And there was light, blinding light, that swept over him like a flood. Now, I do think that though this was a very dramatic and a very sudden conversion, it was previewed, if you like, by some of the things that were going before. So I mentioned already this idea of kick against the goads. And the word that's used was of a thing that you use for a, a, a wild bull or a bullock. If you wanted to control it, you had in, in, in my days <laughs> growing up on a farm, we had an electric prod. Well, that's really what he's saying here. So that there's this wild animal that needed to be controlled. And there was just this something within Saul which was making him really uncomfortable with Jesus Christ. I struggle a little bit with people who come along to church and they're not really Christians. They go, oh, that was very nice. That was lovely. Oh, that was, you know, we, we like being here or whatever like that. I feel more worried about them than I do with the people who just go, that makes me mad. You aren't kidding. I'm not coming here again. Well, that's fine. You can run, but you can't hide, you know, because God will find you. And I think that these prods, if you like, uh, in Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon talks about the, the prods of the wise. And I think that that's what happens. Sometimes don't be too upset when you, you give a friend a book or whatever and they just get really upset. Well, why would they get upset? I remember when I used to do a lot of debates with the new atheists, you know, people like the, these followers of Richard Dawkins and so on. And my favorite motto for them, which kind of wound them up a bit, which is why I did it, I think, was um, uh, their motto was, there is no God and I hate him. Well, how can you hate something which doesn't exist? I don't think there's a Loch Ness monster and I don't hate it. You know, there is no God and I hate him. The very fact that you hate indicates that you're aware of something. And that was certainly so. Again, I like what Calvin says. We should be like quiet horses, meekly allowing ourselves to be turned and guided by him. If ever he spurs us, it should make us more ready to obey him. Saul had plenty to think about. And I think the question, why do you persecute me? That's the probing question. That was the big one. And then verses 10 to 19. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the street of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man. The house of Judas, sorry, on Straight Street. And ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. What shall I do? Saul asked. And, uh, well, we know that from his own testimony. 
and he goes to Straight Street. And that Straight Street up there, it's still there. It's actually still the main street of Damascus. I'd love to go to Damascus. It'd be such an interesting place. Um, and he goes to this man called Ananias. Now, Ananias, we know again from Saul's testimony later on, was a devout Jewish leader like Saul, but who also who had become a Christian. And he is one of the people that Saul was coming to arrest. And Ananias knew it. He knew it. And the Lord comes to him and says, uh, you've got to go and welcome him. You've got to go and get him because he is, he's the one that you really need to, to get hold of. It's like giving himself up to be arrested. It's like a Jew being told, go and welcome Adolf Eichmann. He's coming to visit you. I mean, it, doesn't, it didn't make sense to him. And, and so he did question it. I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. But although he had these fears, he still obeyed God. And notice what is said about Saul. There's so much in here, and we don't have time to go into it all, but just I'll, I'll throw these things out for you. First of all, Saul is praying, and he was actually praying and fasting. What do you think he was praying? Unquestionably, for forgiveness of sins. What have I done? Imagine if you had done something, I mean, just think of something really awful that you didn't think was bad, and then you discover that it was one of the worst things you could possibly do. So he's praying for forgiveness, and surely he's praying for sight. I'm blind. I was blind in that I didn't see who you were, Lord, and now I'm blind because I have seen who you are. And then notice that Saul becomes part of the church he was persecuting. And he is to be God's chosen instrument. Lord. And it's funny, by the way, in his prayer, his prayer was answered because he couldn't see, but he did have a vision of a man called Ananias coming. You know, and Ananias says uh, he'd heard many reports of him. He's come here with authority. And then verse 15, go, this man is my chosen instrument. My chosen instrument. Lord, could you not have chosen somebody better? You know, you think about how we do things. If you were headhunting for an apostle, imagine you're part of the selection committee, you know, or in a church, you're part of the selection committee. For, we want this, this, this. I'd say, I'm, I'm giving you this scumbag as my chosen instrument. And notice as well verse 13, uh, it, sorry, verse 15. It's extraordinary because I had thought this too. I'd thought, yeah, Saul, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. uh -huh. He is the apostle to the Gentiles, but also to their kings and to the people of Israel. It's that phrase, to their kings. Again, you'll see that as we go on. How if, for example, um, in the Bible study animals doing, they're looking at Philippians. Well, Paul's rejoicing at being in prison in Caesar's palace. And because of that, he gets to bring the gospel to Caesar's people. And as we go through the book of Acts, you'll see it over and over again that he is able to bring the gospel to the kings of the Gentiles. And in our day and age, that's what we need as well. We need people who are going to stand up and speak what God's word says to kings and those in authority, to the Gentiles and to the Jews. Paul was also to the Jews, which explains his, his pattern, as we'll see as we go through the book, of always going to the synagogue first. Extraordinary. Without Paul, there'd be no New Testament, there'd be no New Testament church. There would be no Augustine, no Luther, no Wesley. I would argue very strongly there would be no United Kingdom, no America, and Australia as we know it would not exist without this. This is as much part of Australia's history as is Captain Cook coming. Anthony Flew, who was once the world's most famous atheist, and his final book was entitled, There is a God, so he changed his mind, wrote in that book, the combination of Jesus and Paul is the most powerful and persuasive of any religion. One other thing to note, the laying on of hands, uh, and the first words Saul heard as a Christian. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. Imagine that. Brother Saul. What an example of patience and forgiveness. No, let's try you out for a couple of years to see if you're for real. What an example. William Taylor, a 19th century congregational minister, 
said this, and I thought this, I think this is very profound. He says, when one is shunned by others, he's apt to develop into a defiant and exclusive recluse. And if Paul had not been met by the disciples in a loving and trustful spirit, he might have become cynical, angular, or suspicious. In this way, an irreparable damage might have been done to him in the very infancy of his new life. But the kindness of Ananias saved, saved him from this peril. Brother Saul. Now, let me say the, the question of the week. How do you know that you are converted? How do you know that you are a Christian? We can give lots of wrong answers. We can say, I was baptized, I go to church, I'm a good person, uh, I signed a form for Jesus, I went forward, I made a profession of faith. None of that gives you certainty that you are converted. So as uh, you know, I like reading a man just now called Thomas Brooks. And Brooks asked this question. Uh, he has 23 different points, so I'm not going to give you them all, but I've summarized them in this way. How do you know that you are a Christian? You know you are a lost sinner, number one. Number two, you know you cannot save yourself. If you think you can save yourself, you're not a Christian. Number three, you know that angels or humans cannot save you. If you're relying on others to save you, you're not a Christian. Number four, you know that you need a savior to, live, to deliver you from the judgment to come. You will not be able to stand before God and say, well, I did my bit. Number five, you know there is no possibility of being saved except through Jesus Christ, the almighty savior. Jesus is the only one sent by God, anointed, appointed, fitted for this work of salvation. If you think he's just one of many, you're not a Christian. Number six, you know that Christ has paid for all your sin, that he's freely offered to all sinners such as us. You know that you are invited. Number seven, because Christ is my only hope and only good and only savior, I am sincerely willing to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in a matrimonial covenant. Now, what Brooks means by matrimonial covenant is this, it is like getting married. It's saying, I do to Jesus. It's saying, yes, to Jesus. It's saying, I'm willing to take him for my savior and my friend. I'm willing to divorce all others, forsaking all others, without exception or reservation. I'm willing to take him for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. Lord, where you go, I will go. I'm willing to receive him now as prophet, priest, and king on his terms. And then beautifully, Brooks finishes up by saying, I do freely consent to be really Christ, to be presently Christ, to be holy Christ, to be only Christ, to be eminently Christ, and to be forever Christ. How do you know you're a Christian? Because you have thrown everything onto Jesus Christ. Nothing on yourself, nothing on anyone else, nothing on the church everything on Christ. It's all you've got. And for me, in the, in the darkest, darkest moments, that is the most beautiful and extraordinary thing. Thou, art, thou, O Christ, art all I have. You're all. And I would say this to you. If you cannot say that, do not hide behind your baptism. Do not hide behind your church membership. Do not hide behind your religion. Do not hide behind your good works. What do you think of Christ? Is he your all or he's nothing? You cannot have a part Christ. So that's why in verses 18 and 19, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. See, that's what happens. You get it. You see it. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. I was blind, but now I see. He broke his fast, he ate some food, and he was strengthened. So take from this two things. First of all, never, ever give up on anyone. Whilst they are alive, whilst they have breath in their bones, whilst they may be the most the person who hates you most because you are a Christian. Never, ever give up on anyone. You keep praying, Lord, open their eyes that they may see. Lord, forgive. Lord, open. And you'd be astonished at what God does. And by the way, don't give up on yourself either. You may say, oh, I've been trying to be a Christian for so long. No, no, no. Lean on Christ. So never give up on anyone and never rely on anyone except Christ 
for your salvation, including don't rely on your feelings, don't rely on your experiences, don't rely on the voices in your head, don't rely on what other people say. It's just simply this, Lord, you're all I've got, but that's more than enough. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that this man, Saul, was so blind that he persecuted you. That when he met you, he became physically blind, but spiritually could see. And then you opened his eyes and you used him for so many great things. We pray that you would take away our blindness. We pray that you would take away the blindness of the people around us and of the society and the culture in which we live. We ask, O oh Lord our God, that we would be able to place all our faith and trust in you. In your name, amen. I try.